Um, I'm Dane. Hi. <laughs> I work at a company called uh, Cypher Prime Studios. Uh, we run it over at Third and Chestnut. Uh, we make games. And, uh, have you gotten a chance to play any of the games out on the floor? Or? I played the music one. Oh, I didn't know there were more than <laughs> one music one, but I played yeah, the yeah. other. There, there were a few music ones. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, we, we make games. And if you had a chance after this to go play some of the other ones as well. Um, we started up in about 2008, so about maybe five years ago. And um, when we started putting out our games, an interesting thing happened um, by complete chance. We found that uh, children on the autism spectrum were uh, reacting well to games. What happened was we were starting to get emails in from parents saying things like, thank you for making an experience that I can share with my daughter, and things of that nature. And this was very interesting to us because we never designed our games with that in mind. You know, we have a certain aesthetic and a certain design principle that we go for, um, but we never, you know, had autism in mind when we were first introducing the games. Now, for me, I love learning, I love to teach, and I love to play. So when these emails started coming in, I was extremely interested, and I wanted to sort of dig deeper and figure out what it was specifically about our games that made this connection. And um, I'm not an expert. I'm not a uh, neurology expert, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I, I had to go and do a lot of research to sort of figure a lot of these things out. And I spoke with a couple of researchers, I spoke with um, some of the parents, and what I sort of managed to whittle the idea down to is this idea of play. Um, so let's explore that, let's take a look at that. Um, play is usually considered to be a thing that is almost frivolous. It's just something that we do to pass the time for enjoyment, something that makes us feel good, that isn't done with a specific end goal in mind. We do it for you know, recreation, pleasure, enjoyment, things like that. But in actuality, play is much more than that. Uh, for the entire animal kingdom, ourselves included, play is our innate learning mechanism. It is um, the, the way that we structure ourselves, structure the world within ourselves. And games are bundles of play that we then transmit either through culture, you know, games like tag that have been passed down from generations, or through uh, digital distribution in the modern age where we, you can download a game and play it. It's the way that we construct our reality. It's how we figure out what the rules of the world are and how we build connections in our brain so that we can you know, process the world and move forward. And play builds those connections in each of us differently. Um, so the way each person perceives the world, and the way play interacts with that mentality, falls under this sort of umbrella of neurodiversity. Now, have, have you guys heard the term neurodiversity, neurodiversity before? No? Okay. Um, this, this was what really sort of uh, spoke to me when I started looking into this, was that Traditionally, when we look at uh, mentality, we, we look at the way brains are wired. We have a very narrow peak, what we consider to be normal, the sort of neurotypical peak. And ev anything that falls outside of that, be it autism, Asperger's, ADHD, OCD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, um, what we call you know, learning disabilities, are considered to be a disorder. You know, attention deficit disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, autism, syndrome, and all, all of this idea that it is something that needs to be um, fixed, like a disease. What neurodiversity is, is the idea that all of these conditions fall under the branch of normal in different areas of it, this idea of a gradient of normal. And so instead of talking about somebody being on the autism spectrum or being on the attention deficit hyperactivity spectrum that exists, it puts us all on the same spectrum. And so instead of being a thing that needs to be fixed, it becomes just a different way to think. Now, this becomes very fun because play is how we use the way that we think to interact with the world. It's what teaches us how to take the tools that we're given and interact with the world, learn about our environment, and affect change on it. So the way that we think is closely linked to our concept of intelligence. And for a long time, intelligence was considered to be this sort of monolithic entity. That is, oh, you are intelligent, or you're not. You have intelligence, or you don't. 
And that was a bit uh, stifling. So in about the mid-80s, there was a researcher by the name of Howard Gardner that proposed this idea of seven types of intelligence rather than this sort of monolithic entity. And he broke it down through um, you know, your, your specific your sort of traditional logic, mathematical, um, linguistic side of things, but added to it. So for instance, kinesthetic intelligence, how well you can use your body in your environment, hand-eye coordination, things of that nature. Um, the spatial intelligence, how you, how you can picture your environment without actually needing to, to see it and move about in it. And very specifically, interpersonal intelligence, which is how you relate to the people around you, the expe expectations of their behavior that you create, and how accurate your model of the people around you is to the reality of it. The thing to keep in mind about that is that everybody specializes differently. You might have somebody that has excellent kinesthetic intelligence, you know, somebody that's a, a ballerina or an acrobat, but suffers a bit on the linguistic side of things. It might be dyslexic. That's fine. You might have somebody that has excellent musical abilities and poor interpersonal abilities. And this all falls under that gradient of normal that we had spoken about earlier. So the interesting thing about this is that when you create a bundle of play, when you create a game trying to transmit knowledge, in order for it to be broadly accessible, you need to target, in my experience, at least three of these intelligences. You can create a game, like for instance a, a word game, that demands very high levels of linguistic intelligence and not much else. And you're only going to appeal to the people that have that high degree of linguistic intelligence. Most games use linguistic, kinesthetic, and spatial as their three. So for instance, you'll have a game that has tutorials. Press A to jump. Go, go run this, que this quest. Here is how you outfit your character. And also has um, dialogue between characters, explaining why and giving context for what you're doing. It relies heavily on kinesthetic intelligence, how to be able to use your hand-eye coordination and navigate a controller and navigate your space. And it relies on a high degree of spatial intelligence to sort of be able to make sense and internalize a world that doesn't really exist. But on top of that, many games assume a high level of interpersonal intelligence, what we consider to be a normal level of interpersonal intelligence. So they expect that if I tell you a character needs to go from A to B, that you will understand the motivation of that character because of a level of intelligence that we assume. And games need to do that in some ways, because most of them rely on additive learning. Now, additive learning is um, when you're teaching in the form of sentences like this, but, where you take something that they already know and change it slightly. For instance, if you had never played a game like racquetball, for instance, I could say, well, it's like tennis, but, I explained the differences there. If you had never played the game Mass Effect, or any game necessarily, but I know that you are sort of on the sci-fi things and you understand you know, that realm, I could tell you that, well, it's like Star Trek, but, and you'll, we'll at least be on the same page, and we have a, a starting point. The problem is that if you don't share knowledge base, then you're not going to learn. And the play session becomes useless. So if you struggle with kinesthetic intelligence, let's say you have poor hand-eye coordination, or a physical disability, or even are just not somebody that played you know, game, games that require twitch reflex when you were younger, then controls are going to be very difficult if they require that high level of kinesthetic intelligence. If you struggle on the linguistic side of things, let's say you are dyslexic or are even just playing a game that is in a language that isn't your first language, then things like tutorials and text and dialogue aren't going to connect with you. They aren't going to transmit information because you aren't able to access it on that axis. And if you struggle with interpersonal intelligence, like many people on the autism spectrum do, then characters, character motivation, avatars, this idea of placing yourself in another person's shoes doesn't work the same way you're expecting it to for exactly the same reason. And so what you need to do is sort of move past additive learning.